as a crucial arm of our democracy has never been in doubt. Today, in a climate of quick political and social change, the bureaucracy lends the semblance of stability and permanence to anchor our polity. Yet it is ironical that it is now the bureaucracy seems increasingly under attack. First, for allegedly holding the system to ransom by the sheer all-pervasive influence it commands, but more seriously, for having become too politicized. Increasingly, uh, the bureaucracy has been interfered with in uh, more ways than one by the politicians. And bureaucracy, in turn, has depended for favors on the politicians. And so this nexus is built up between some uh, politicians on the one hand and some bureaucrats on the other. And this number has increased. So if one says that there has been politicization of bureaucracy, I think by and large it will be a uh, correct statement. I would say that perhaps uh, because of these uh, identifications and then victimizations, uh, there has been this politicization because otherwise it was not necessary. I, w I, would know, I would know for one for very easily that would whoever be the political master, I would serve him because it is his policy that I am being implemented. And that is the way I think most of the bureaucrats really feel. Most of the bureaucrats that I have talked to, now of course I've, I retired four years ago, but uh, most of the bureaucrats that I have spoken to, they all feel very shaky because the majority of them are not even anywhere near the proximity of the centers of power. It's only a few individuals which are there. But then if you go along and identify or label people as so-and-so's man or of that party, then I don't think that's really very fair to the bureaucracy. It hurts the, it hurts the country itself. Politicization is part of a process of development which is taking place. Either you look at it from the point of view of economy or from the point of view of polity or even from the point of view of general administration as such. So therefore to say that administration is getting politicized is really to bring out the nature of administration. Because what is administration? What are bureaucrats? What are civil servants? They are the tools of a state. And it is the character and the message which has got to the state has, got, state has got to give to the society that finds expression through these particular tools. But if by politicization what you really mean is that the politics of the day is so very different from the politics of yesterday that those who were associated with the garment of yesterday seems absolutely to be lost in the whole midstream of administration as such. That could be so. I would uh, try to differentiate between the good politicization and the bad politicization. The good politicization is where bureaucrats understand the aims of the independent government of India, where the emphasis is on creating a welfare state and tailor their performance accordingly. The other kind of politicization is actually what should be described as psychophancy, where you butter up your master so that you get the good things of life. In the Whitehall model of parliamentary democracy which we adopted, the bureaucrat's brief is clearly defined. His is an apolitical, dispassionate and unbiased style to imbibe the administration with credibility and objectivity. Simultaneously, final authority is vested with the politician who is the duly elected representative of the people. In an ideal textbook situation, the bureaucrat and the politician are expected to remain within their domain. And as long as they do so, the normal dynamics of government function smoothly with no friction, fear or favor. The bureaucrat is supposed to be someone who is apolitical. He is there who knows the rules and the regulations, all that has gone on in the past, what are the precedents, what has been the particular policy. And his role is to give objective advice to the political side. Thereafter, whether his advice is accepted or not, it then becomes his duty to implement, with all integrity and honesty, whatever directions are given. Therefore, the bureaucrat really has to serve the political master. And naturally, whoever may be the political master, it becomes his duty to serve that person faithfully. I think it's not so categorical as all that. They don't have to follow. They have to follow within very definite, prescribed norms of propriety. And if they go outside that, then they do it for reasons 
uh, which are other than the service norms. It is generally said that administration has got to be neutral. It is neutral where it comes to the question of non-discrimination between the various, what you call, interests in a society or the various individuals, groups or communities of the society. But where the major end of the state is concerned, administration can never be neutral. You see, even in, during the British days when we used to say that administration was above politics altogether, but could you really say that administration during the British days could have taken I stand against the interests of the empire. Could you say that it would have said that no, the dependence on the British empire is wrong and we support what you call Gandhiji's movement of quit India? Certainly not. Now to that extent, administration has got to reflect the viewpoint of the state as such. I would go to the extent of defining the role of the bureaucracy as a safety buffer between the unlimited aims of the politician and the rights of the citizen. Over the years, a change of government, especially ones involving change in the ruling party, has seen the ritual of administrative musical chairs, the transfusion of new bureaucratic blood replacing the old. The rationale behind this exercise often being one of locating and rewarding trusted bureaucrats. For most media observers, this has promoted a culture of victimization and rehabilitation. And in its extreme blatant form, it has been a dubious exercise culminating often in mass transfers. In the centre, it has now been an accepted tradition that with the change in government, senior bureaucrats are removed wholesale. But the allegation has been that often seniority and merit are sacrificed in these transfers and that the transfers themselves transmit disturbing signals down the rank and file, damaging the morale and confidence of the bureaucracy. It is wrong to do such a thing. I would say that wherever you find that certain people stand or they have got a public, public image of being associated with one particular type of policies and the other what you call party comes in with a different type of ideology or a party, it is but necessary that some of these people must move out. As a matter of fact, you would remember Mr. Huxer. Huxer is a very good example, though he was not, uh, I would say, a bureaucrat when he left the planning commission, but he was very clear in his mind that the type of things with which Mr. Huxer's name was associated were not the type of things which the next government was wanting to do. And he resigned and left that particular thing. And let us assume that if there was another person who was very much in the service at that time, again associated with certain ideas, because when you reach a certain level in the government or in administration, you get associated with certain ideas and certain names. So the incoming government, I would say, have a right to move some of these particular people. But mass transfer, to which you made a reference, will certainly not be good, I would say, as a method of keeping the morale of administration high. Well, it can happen. Why not? Why I should mean, it you happen? have the American administration where 5,000 people get transferred in one day. But we don't have that here. We follow the Whitehall model of not government. Not necessarily. Where... Not we follow our own model. We don't follow uh, Whitehall or any other uh, uh, government. We follow our own system. Would you think and the system is defective? Uh, no, it's not that. I mean, it, this is again a question of, uh, you know, individual decision. A new government comes in, uh, you must have your own team. You have your own political team, the political team comes in, it settles in. And then there are transfers which are due. I mean, after all, there are government of India rules. Uh, people are transferred from one ministry to another. Everyone doesn't stay static in the same position. Doesn't that so the initial, uh, initial uh, movements will always be there. There's nothing wrong in it. If there is a new government, with a new philosophy, a new ideology, new approach, and it wants to make a new beginning, I can imagine that they would like to change, say, the finance secretary, the defense secretary, the foreign secretary. These are understandable. But I certainly can't understand why they should change the uh, personnel secretary or the tourism secretary or the agriculture secretary. These are areas where I don't think there's a great difference between an outgoing government and an incoming government on philosophical or ideological grounds. Senior officers uh, should, not be, should not be shifted around just with the change of government. They have put in well over 25 years, sometimes even 30 years of service. And uh, they're well seasoned. Uh, they have a fund of knowledge uh, which can be better utilized. And you, you put them into sideline them. You are uh, not utilizing a talent which is available, knowledge that is available, experience that is available. Therefore, it's a loss to the country itself. 
but it is in the state level that these mass transfers are often conducted as crude exercises. Here, the politician bureaucrat interface is more frequent and direct. And in recent years, there have been allegations of substantial political interference in postings and transfers in most states. Some of these decisions are quite explicitly influenced with caste and extraneous considerations being paramount. I could tell you um, uh, a number of instances where uh, the bureaucracy has been so politicized and uh, especially on, along caste lines in many states that uh, <coughs> every bureaucrat uh, um, belonging to a particular caste uh, finds his patron in some politician or the other and uh, if the caste system is strong then the politician irrespective of their political differences uh, congregate on the issue of caste and uh, I have, uh, I know of personally of many officers who have uh, flourished in every regime only on the basis of the fact that they have had patrons in, uh, in every government. The pressures there are much greater. And uh, the uh, consequences can be much more direct. Um, administration in the states sometimes operates in a, at a very crude level. It's, they make it very obvious that a particular bureaucrat is being punished for resisting the political pressures. Uh, at the center, the things are done in a more subtle manner. Why is it that when a minister or a prime minister visits a particular place or a state or a constituency, people rush to him and they say, sir, we need justice and you are the only person who could do justice to me. Why is it that people you see rush to or write letters to the MPs and others saying that uh, the law and order is breaking down and you do something. All this thing happens when there is lack of confidence between the people and the administration. The collectors, the commissioners, and people who are working in the field at junior and middle levels, they are as much politicized as bureaucrats in uh, the higher ranks of bureaucracy. Because there are the nexuses between the MLA, the MP, the local bigwig, the collector, the deputy collector, the SP, the deputy SP and all that. And the politicizes, politicization is as pervasive there as uh, anywhere else. But if transfers and postings are the carrots being offered to seduce the bureaucrats' loyalty, it is the enormous power some bureaucrats exercise which has been the scope of media attention. Some of these super bureaucrats or supercrats as the media calls them have power way in excess of their normal brief. And many of them bask in the spotlight of media publicity. Political observers claim that it is the over-centralized nature of decision-making and the importance given lately to officers such as the PMO, which has created the supercrat syndrome. The public perception is that these high-profile bureaucrats have usurped power, which is not theirs, legitimately. It's a weak minister who allows a bureaucrat to become what you call a supercrat. But what about um, situations like the prime minister's office, for instance? There, a joint secretary you know, is more powerful than secretaries in many governments. That again, you see, depends on the minister and the secretary. You see, today we have a prime ministerial system of government. I think it's, uh, we've come a long way from cabinet system. Even in England, nobody really believes that we have a cabinet system. It's a prime ministerial system, and therefore the prime minister's office will enjoy a certain status, a certain power, a certain clout. And uh, officers who are in the Prime Minister's office will have a certain amount of authority and clout. And I'm afraid they will tend to be identified with the Prime Minister. They are on the staff of the Prime Minister, like they're on the staff of the President in the United States. But that's no reason why another minister or a secretary in that ministry should feel that uh, he is overridden by the Prime Minister's joint secretary. Well, it is very flattering to hear this kind of a thing, but I think it's simply untrue. Uh, you, are, you, I think, accurately described me as I was just a joint secretary in the Prime Minister's office. Now, that's exactly what I was. I was just a joint secretary in the Prime Minister's office. But being a joint secretary in the Prime Minister's office, I was obliged to interact with ministers and officials in a manner in which perhaps I would not have been obliged to interact had I been a Joint Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. Um, beyond that, I doubt that anyone was in awe of me. We all worship a chair, and where is the center of power, that's where everybody gets attracted to. Now, if the center of power is the Prime Minister's office, and everybody goes there. Now, that is not also very good, because uh, 
then in that type of uh, eventuality, even the ministers become redundant. I don't think it can be sustained that I or any of the, my colleagues in PMO were really involved in political activity as such. We were involved in serving our political masters. There is a general trend in, in our country to eulogize a bureaucrat. I mean, look at what happened to Mani Shankaraya or a Gopi Arora, for instance. They were powerful people, and not that um, they were not powerful people in the past. But the way the press has given publicity, the media has given publicity to them, I mean, they were not only super uh, bureaucrats, they were super ministers. And I think it's a matter of great shame for our democracy <coughs> that a service which is uh, supposed to be anonymous, bureaucracy is supposed to be anonymous, uh, should, should be highlighted like this. The more serious charge being leveled against the bureaucrats today is that they are actively participating in an alleged nexus with the politician and the businessman to promote specific corporate interests. In a political atmosphere dominated by a dispensation complex, the role of a bureaucrat who connives with the politician to dispense favours on a quid pro quo basis becomes crucial. Political analysts cite examples of recent FIRs filed against senior bureaucrats in the Bofors and HDW scandals to raise questions on the integrity and the changing morals of a section of the Indian bureaucracy. Those who were too eager to get into what you call, as I call it, uh, the iron triangle in which you see the businessman is one arm, the bureaucracy is another arm, and the politician is another arm. And if you get into this particular triangle, you're trapped. Now, this is what we have got to avoid. And I would say that the bureaucracy and the politicians both will have to learn the lessons and have got to see that they will not be able to last if this sort of an unhealthy triangle is formed. This is not a golden triangle. This is a horrible iron triangle. I refuse to believe that a bureaucrat becomes a part of that triangle wholly because he's under great pressures. It's more often than not the desire for rewards, for promotion, for monetary benefits that induces him to do so because the politician is shrewd enough to pick his targets. Well, wherever it is proved, corrective action should be taken. And what kind of corrective action? Who is held accountable? Whatever, whatever the law uh, specifies should be taken. Who is held accountable? Is it the bureaucrat or the politician? Everybody should be held accountable. But as I said, you cannot discuss this in generalities. You must be specific about it. Well, and I agree with you that all these nexuses uh, well, it exists, we know it exists, but then again it's upon the minister concerned. All the scandals uh, that we are reading about in the papers, they show that the, chicken, the chicks do come home to roost. I mean, bureaucrats shouldn't think that uh, they can do all these things, violate all sorts of norms and still get scot free, um, as uh, evident from the recent exposures. Obviously, bureaucrats are getting into trouble. And uh, this is a very significant lesson for them, signal for them. It cannot be denied that the last few years, Indian bureaucracy has received a battering. From within the institution, there have been criticism of crumbling conventions and damaging norms. But beyond the charges and allegations, it becomes important to locate the reasons for the malaise. And in this context, the moot question is, who is to blame for this state of affairs? I don't think the bureaucrat is ever in doubt as to what he has to do. He, he knows what exactly is right and what is wrong, and he knows where he must resist pressure and where he uh, just cannot take pressure, yield to pressure. But despite that, they, they are doing it, a large number of uh, bureaucrats, because uh, they want to um, uh, advance. You know, they want their promotions in time or out of turn. Uh, there is a lot of difference. There is a world of difference, for instance, between a good posting and a bad posting today. And I think it is uh, postings more than anything else which is the uh, crumb which the politician throws at the bureaucrat and the bureaucrat bites. No, I think it is basically passing the buck. As I told you, a bureaucrat is a tool. He can be used for good things, he can be used for bad things. The responsibility is with the politician under whom the bureaucrat has to work. So why not pin the blame where it belongs? The politician is already a very badnam kind of a person. The bureaucrat is not. And what I'm saying is that there is a certain framework within which the bureaucracy is supposed to function. And they must function within that framework. So I'll rather blame the politician has no frame. Therefore, the bureaucrat is more to be blamed than the politician.
if somebody is coming to take advantage of me, it's up to me to resist that and see that I am not taken advantage of. I would say yes and no, because I'll tell you, there are more than 40 to 50 percent of administrators, even today, who don't have the feet of clay. I've always said that a secretary and a minister should not develop a symbiotic relationship. They must work together, but not seem to be colluding or collaborating in illegal purposes. That's nothing to do with political interference. That's clearly violating the law. If there has been such an instance, I think both the minister and the secretary are equally culpable. Most politicians deny that they have politicized the bureaucracy to any substantial degree. They assert their right to make the final decisions and point out the subtle but important difference between political decision making and political interference. And to many critics, it is the bureaucracy which has allowed itself to be blatantly tampered with, often being a willing partner in this dubious nexus. To these critics, the institution has been subverted by those actively colluding with unscrupulous politicians only for their personal gain and advancements. Political interference is when the politician enters into day-to-day -day administration. But where policy is given, an administrator is given the freedom to operate and work, then it does not really matter. But this is what you call a chemically pure solution. I am giving it to you. We shouldn't um, lose sight of the reality of government in words. Now, what you call political interference, now I would call political decision making. Now, if I was a minister, I would expect to make the decisions. I wish to make the decisions myself. And if I run my ministry, and if I direct that my ministry should take certain kinds of decisions, should administer certain programs in a particular way, well, that's not political interference. You have laid back ministers. You have very assertive and um, uh, active ministers. We don't believe in interference. We believe in results. We hold people accountable. Why should I interfere with them? What if a bureaucrat uh, doesn't want to carry on, carry out what you think is... Uh, what I think is government policy, it's his job to carry it out. And if he doesn't, because he feels that it's violating some constitutional norm or law... He or doesn't procedures? have to. I wouldn't give him such an order. There can be good politics and bad politics. There are good politicians and bad politicians. And to an extent, the bureaucrat has to consult his conscience. He knows what the rules and regulations are, what the law of the land is, what the Constitution declares. And when he realizes at any point of time that the instruction given to him goes outside the purview of the Constitution, outside the purview of the laws, outside the purview of the rules and regulations, it is his business to stand up and tell the politician where he gets off. The media focus on the changing face of Indian bureaucracy, the birth of super bureaucrats, the scandals tainting key officials and the regular transfers of inconvenient officers brings into sharp relief the predicament of the system. And the question remains whether all these factors have affected the efficiency of the civil service and in the process eroded the credibility of the institution itself. It uh, hasn't eroded the credibility of the uh, bureaucracy, but it has certainly eroded the type of inputs that the bureaucracy would be able to make. I think that is what has certainly happened. Uh, for example, when you've done that, uh, no bureaucrat would be prepared to take a decision. He would not be prepared to go along and give very objective advice. He would always be trying to hide or under some, some pretext or take shelter somewhere or the other. He would not be fearless in giving his objective advice. Well, it has not only affected, the, it certainly affected the credibility and the morale, it has also affected uh, its uh, efficiency and its effectiveness. On the whole, I would say that the Indian bureaucracy has been performing more satisfactorily than one imagines. It has become the weeping boy of the press and, sadly enough, even of parliament. The point is that, you know, government systems, once they're eroded, I remember in 85 when we Would came, you admit the government system is eroded? Of course it has. There's no doubt about it. And I mean, you can't, you, can't dispute, you can't dispute something which has already happened. But is there now, anything that uh, is being done by you to sort of check that erosion? You know, first of all, by you must government. realize the government of India is a very large uh, institution by itself. And uh, you will always have isolated actions uh, which may smack of vendetta or personal pick or the rest of it. But by and large, the exercise which we are going through is that for the last three, four years, we've seen a gradual erosion of the system and we want to restore.